All right, we are at the 30. Welcome, folks. Welcome to the second Monday of the month, uh, Movement Monday. This is the Ujima Hour. Uh, welcome to the Ujima Hour. I am Michael Tekken Strode of the Cola Nut Collaborative, uh, Cooperation, Collaboration, Study, and Working Group, uh, and a number of other spaces. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for tuning in uh, for this evening's uh, Ujima Hour broadcast. Uh, the Ujima Hour, as you uh, have uh, no doubt heard previously on this broadcast, uh, is a space where we are unpacking, where we're digging into an exploration of the Black social and solidarity economy through intimate and formal conversation. Um, we are trying to get at uh, non-professional, non-economist -econ uh, opinions and, and views uh, of the economy. What does the economy look like um, at the communal level? What does it look like when organizers and artists and um, you know, activists, uh, uh, movement theorists, you know, uh, and, and just, you know, people in, in uh, who are, are doing the work, who are, who are grinding away um, and challenging uh, systems, what does it look like when they think about the economy? Um, and specifically, you know, because there certainly is so much uh, um, thought around um, non-traditional notions of economy right now, what does it look like uh, when, when we examine that from a black lens, from a black frame? Um, how do uh, folks who are engaged in projects in black communities actually see these notions of economy uh, and, and then expanding that out? How do we deal with these notions of cooperation, of capital, of autonomy uh, in connection with these notions of economy? Uh, so I am Michael Tekken Strode of the Cola Nut Collaborative, as you can see from that logo down in the bottom right corner. Uh, the Cola Nut Collaborative is Chicago's uh, only um, time-based skill and sharing exchange. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I sort of say only in air quotes in the sense that, you know, there are lots of ways that communities are, are meeting their needs. And uh, time, time sharing, skill sharing, service sharing um, are things that people are doing outside of the framework of, a t of time banking. Uh, but certainly, you know, we are trying to formalize some of those practices inside of time banking uh, because we are trying to get at, again, you know, these informal ways that we uh, engage the economy, uh, these non-monetary ways that we engage economy. And we are using the time bank as a framework in which to do that. Uh, and this broadcast is really just an extension of work that's been happening um, within the Colonet Collaborative, but also work that's been happening within the other formation, uh, Cooperation, Collaboration, Study, and Working Group, uh, which I'll, I'll tell you a, a bit more about later um, in terms of our schedule and what we have coming up. Uh, but Cooperation, Collaboration, Study, and Working Group is an, is an intentional gathering space uh, of, of folks who are examining the the historical and contemporary examples of, uh, of black cooperatives and black cooperation uh, within sort of within black radical organizing, black radical traditions, uh, and, and trying to, again, you know, draw those into contemporary ways that we uh, engage the economy, that we meet our needs, uh, because ultimately uh, we are challenged by um, the particular capitalist construct that we live in uh, to meet those needs uh, in, in, in ways that they have now, that they have presently afforded, right? Um, so, so how can we think of cooperatives as a way that we can um, sidestep um, that particular type of grind, that particular type of hustle, um, so that we can meet our needs in, in, in different ways, in ways that, that emphasize collective ownership and collective decision-making, uh, that emphasize um, beyond self-determination, that collective self-determination uh, when people come together um, as communities and as associations and as, 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 as small groups um, to build things together. Um, so that's what we've, been, what we've been examining uh, here on the Ujima Hour. Um, and we've had lots of ways, uh, lots of folks who have uh, provided us with some insights. So specifically this year, um, we've had Joan Fadairo, of uh, my uh, co-facilitator and colleague um, at Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, in March, we had uh, Damon Williams of the Let Us Breathe Collective and Ergo. Um, in April, uh, we had Maida McNeil of Honey Pot Performance and Fifth City Project. Um, so we've had some dynamic folks that have uh, have jumped in uh, with us and engaged with us in these conversations, um, and we we hope to continue that that uh, that the, that uh, space tonight um, with Ayende Jean Baptiste, you know, who I'll introduce also uh, uh, very briefly. Um, but first of all, I just want to you know um, dig into uh, where we are right now, right, um, and, and where you know. Um, where I've traveled. So um, one of the things that that we discussed uh, last month with Meta, um, and you know, also this came up uh, with Chiniere. You know, um, I, I've highlighted that you know um, in that that latter part of March um, when uh, we were all engaging in a 
perhaps a collective grieving process uh, for the year that did not happen. Um, that you know there was a there was a lull in you know my desire to be engaged, right? And, you know, my, my I'm, and my um, trying to figure out, trying to navigate, and trying to negotiate what was the next steps, right? Um, so you know we have that period of that uh, maybe two week collective grieving. Um, that is followed then by this uh, resurgence of, of, uh, of online engagement in ways that we can connect with uh, colleagues and comrades, you know, in other cities um, that had not been available, right? Because all of this organizing had, had, had been happening locally. Um, and so um, after that collective grieving process, after that resurgence of, of, of activity, um, there's, there's all sorts of new connections to be made, right? There's all sorts of new opportunities and new uh, ways that that we that we are thinking about connecting up um, our ways that we're working, um, our ways that we're collaborating, um, and you know I know that um, even within the Colinet Collaborative, last month I had the opportunity to facilitate um, our monthly time salon. A monthly time salon at the Colinet Collaborative happens on the fourth Friday of every month at six p.m. Um, and that's where we do time bank orientation, so new members can drop drop into those. Uh, those time salons, and they can see what, what what's happening within the time bank. Um, they can understand sort of how people engage with the time bank, um, and they can find ways that are meaningful to them to plug in to that time bank um, here in Chicago. Um, so during that fourth Friday, um, you know, this was the second virtual time salon I had done. So, you know, we, we did one, um, an experimental one, as it were, you know, at the end of March, and then we had an opportunity to just kind of shift into that space formally in April. But, you know, um, it was one of the best time salons that I had done, right? You know, and, and, and I I am traditionally, you know, focused on, you know, this in-person interaction and, and, and this notion that um, that there is nothing that can, can recreate the feeling of, of, of sort of, um, of togetherness in person. Um, but that particular virtual time salon challenged me. Um, and it challenged me in the same way that I was challenged by um, People's Hub and Elandria Williams. Um, and Jess, um, you know, who, who really uh, talk about the power of virtual space and how you can make a virtual space, how you can make an online space really feel as tethered, as connected, as engaging as uh, an in-person gathering. Uh, so, you know, that was another opportunity during that virtual time salon to see how we could uh, figure out ways that we can, again, move this work forward, transform, change, uh, shift, um, and, and use um the mediums that are available to us now to continue the work of organizing um, way in, in ways that we we had not anticipated, right? That we would need to do, you know, um, uh, until this uh, COVID nineteen occurred, right? So that's um, that's been you know where Cold Nut Collaborative is. Um, the same uh, has continued with uh, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. Uh, we have continued to have our biweekly study groups um, every. Um, every other Sunday. Um, so the uh, next one is this coming Sunday. Um, so, you know, uh, make sure that you look out for that. I'll make sure that I post the link to that uh, Cooperation for Liberation gathering um, in the, the um, comment section. Um, but yes, you know, just uh, make sure you're, you're plugged in. Um, Cooperation for Liberation meets from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And um, we are continuing to have our regular public session where we unpack articles, we unpack text, um, and, and ultimately, again, we're trying to really deeply understand um, how we can use these cooperative models in the contemporary space um, to advance the self-determination of black communities um, in ways that, you know, that, that, that will um, ensure that we can um, better engage and, and manage our own labor, right? Self-determine, you know, how we use our own labor, how we use our own time, um, and, and how we develop economies um, that really, you know, return full value to us for the time that we put into um, our workplaces. Um, so that that's what we're doing in Cooperation for Liberation. Um, we are currently working with the Co-op Ed Center. Um, uh, Sochi Espinosa is the executive director there. And uh, the Co-op Ed Center does cooperative education um, for uh, black and brown communities. And ultimately, um, we're partnering to do a, a, a co-op gathering, or we were partnering to do a co-op gathering, which is now transformed because we cannot gather. But, you know, we did have a, a, a wonderful workshop with the Co-op Ed Center, um, co-facilitated by the COLA Nut Collaborative and um, Co-op for Lib, um, demonstrating how time banking can be used to engage um, cooperatives and sharing their skills, sharing their talents. Um, so, again, you know, that's some of the work that, it, that has continued um, within uh, the COLA Nut Collaborative and that we are continuing to engage. Um, 
and you know, I, I'm I'm really excited to to note that you know I've I've been um, I've now joined the board of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, um, and, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, Friday. We've got um, this uh, Re Resist and Build Strategy Summit just to see you know what are some of the ways that we can again engage this moment, use this moment um, to really speak to the longer range planning beyond mutual aid, right? So beyond this this moment where mutual aid has experienced this resurgence to really think about how we are doing society, society development, right? You know, out of this process. How does it look to make this flourish over a longer period of time, over a longer term, for, far into the future? Um, so that's some, some work that I'm excited to get uh, to with the US Solidarity Economy Network, um, as well as, you know, the ongoing work uh, with um, the New Economy Coalition um, as part of the Educators Working Group. Um, just strengthening our facilitation skills, strengthening our messaging um, to, to really dig into, you know, what is the, um, the what are the economic models that, that our communities are, 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 are wanting, are thirsting for, are seeking, um, and how can we use this moment to advance those, right, to, to continue to move those things forward. Um, to that end, you know, there's been a call that I put out recently on uh, the Colonet Collaborative uh, site, um, that was really talking about uh, formal consensus as a, as a sort of governance model. Um, so, you know, the, the two things that I've been deeply focused on uh, personally have been looking at, you know, again, these economics um, as, as, as um, community economies, um, you know, the, the, the informal economies, but also looking at governance structures and, and how we think about, you know, organizational structures. Um, and that, that really led me to, to do a deep dive into to formal consensus lately. Um, so you see there on Conflict and Consensus by C.T. Butler, um, a founder of uh, Food Not Bombs, um, along with Keith McHenry. And so, you know, just thinking about how these consensus structures, how we're thinking about, you know, nonviolent governance structures, right? You know, thinking about structures that, that, that don't require us to be in, in, compet in a competitive dynamic when we're in meeting spaces and when we're um, developing organizations. Um, there's, a, I'm looking to, I put out a call on the Colonet Collaborative page because I'm looking to actually have an informal conversation on consensus and perhaps troubleshoot the consensus structure um, because it could be that, you know, um, my examination of this and even my use of it, you know, in some of the meeting spaces I've been in um, is, is short-sighted, right? There could be things that I'm missing. So I'm looking forward to an opportunity to have uh, a, a, a conversation with folks who have been experiencing the structure, who have been using the decision-making structure of consensus um, to figure out, you know, whether or not it's one of those things that we want to um, have as a, as a more regular space that people are learning about. Um, and to that end, you know, um, I, I did a, nut, a deep dive as well into um, uh, Seeds for Change, uh, Changes, uh, a consensus handbook. Um, so, you know, this, this actually is a much more robust text than uh, on conflict and consensus, but it really is just looking about looking at how we take consensus, which, um, you know, they, they both highlight they work very well within this sort of small, uh, intimate group con context, but, you know, it takes great intention and care to scale them up. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking about, you know, building um, a sort of consensus in infrastructure inside of a group that becomes larger, you know, that that where, where you've got, you know, hundreds of folks, you know, who are doing these uh, spokes council models, um, it really takes some intention with how you um, inform people about how these structures are operating and how they're working. Um, so those are, 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 are two texts that I, I have been digging into. And the third text that I'll, I'll just highlight um, uh, because I'm a, I am a friend of AK Press. Um, and if you're not a friend of AK Press, you probably should be at some point. You know, you get every title that AK Press publishes um, throughout the year um, for that, that $30 a month. So if you got a spare $30 to throw around at the press, you know, just put it up. Revolutionary Press is necessary. Um, but I, I picked up from uh, AK Press Oppose and Propose um, by Andrew Cornell. Now, Oppose and Propose is actually a... Um, it's part of a brief biography of something called Movement for a New Society, um, which, you know, um, comes into existence uh, in the latter 60s and, uh, and early 70s. And they are trying to think, they're doing uh, what, what might be called uh, propositional or prefigurative um, organizing, which just, you know, notes that 
look, you know, we want to do oppositional organizing because they're they're anti-war, right? So like C.T. Butler, they're 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 folks who are opposed to war, um, and 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 nonviolent resistance is is uh, one of their strategies. But they're also people who want to think about what does the world look like on the other side, and do we have the ability to develop models and to deploy models inside of our organizations and and inside of our lives that look at what the future of life could look like, you know, on the other side of war, on the other side of capitalism, on the other side of uh, the, the, the fossil fuel and the carbon-based economy. Um, so Oppose and Propose is another text uh, that I would highly recommend, um, you know, um, uh, that's available on AK Press. And these are three things that, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly cycling through, moving in and out of text, but, you know, um, these are three things right now that are really informing my thinking about um, how I approach these conversations um, and this organizing around the economy. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to um, folks who are interested, who, who uh, would be interested in a conversation on consensus. Uh, feel free to chime in in the, in the chat. Um, you know, make yourself known that, that if, you, if you have not already chimed in on the, the survey that was sent around or the um, Facebook post that was uh, put up, uh, feel free to drop a note in the comment that, you know, you might be interested in being a part of that conversation on consensus. Um, because ultimately, you know, uh, we need decision-making infrastructure that does not uh, put us in a competitive dynamic, that does not put us oppositional to one another, um, which ultimately I've seen uh, fragment spaces, fragment or organizations and fragment movements. So um, I'm looking forward to that conversation. Um, and hopefully you saw that, you know, when at, as a part of that conversation um, was posted, and I actually did not put that image in um, tonight's broadcast, but El Cambalache, um, which is an organization out of Chiapas. Um, uh, Dr. Aaron Aru Aruajo um, posted um, or sent me a message on after that post, which really was uh, talking about uh, El Cambalache uh, is doing a solidarity economy. Um, well, actually, no, they didn't call it a solidarity economy. They called it a decolonial economy um, session in June. Um, it's it's something like you know four weeks. Um, but you know, uh, yeah. So so they they're they're doing a workshop on you know on decolonizing your economy, right? Um, and you know certainly you know Chiapas is a space that is is ripe and rich with you know prefigurative and you know future future centered future focused um post carbon post capital organizing strategies um so i i will i'll make sure that that gets into the comment section as well um tonight uh all of that said um we are here on the ujima hour uh because we want to have these uh radical conversations around economy radical conversations around governance um and conversations around communal liberation, communal self-determination. Um, and we've done that traditionally from four perspectives. We've done that from, from the perspective of cooperation. Um, so what does it look like um, for communities to be in cooperation? What are the, the deeper aspects of cooperation that we should be learning from? Um, you know, and, and just when we get to that root of that word, right? You know, and before we get to cooperatives, you know, what does it mean to be in cooperation with one another? Um, and 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 what is relation? What is the role that relationship building plays within cooperation? Um, we've examined capital, um, and we've examined capital from that perspective of the eight forms of capital. Um, you know, just recognizing, uh, and this is only one model, right? You know, there are multiple ways to think about these eight forms of capital. But you know, social, material, financial, living, intellectual, experiential, spiritual, and cultural. Um, so you know, these this, these forms of capital that exist, financial is only one part of that, right? Um, but we've got seven other ways that we can be engaging with each other and thinking about um, diverse economies and pluralist economies um, are, are ways that we can think about diversifying how we engage with the world and with each other. And then we've talked about that notion of economy. Um, so this is the model of uh, Kate Raworth, uh, the donut economy model, which you know really looks at the fact that there are some planetary limits, there's some ecological limits that we can't go past. And then there are some basic social foundations that we want to have. And if we can do that, then we can find the space for justice, the find the space for just transition um, in, the, in, in, uh, in that donut, right? You know, so we can find a space where, where everybody uh, does, where no one has to worry about food, no one has to worry about housing, uh, no one has to worry about these forms of inequity uh, that we currently exist in. Um, 
And that's sort of our, our donut economy, right? You know, and that's only one economic model, you know, but we're talking about, you know, models of economy that that are, are, are pluralist, you know, that allow us to kind of have, um, as, as, uh, as the Zapatistas talk about, a, a world where many worlds fit, right? Um, and, you know, ultimately allow us to move towards that space of equity that, that we should all be seeking, right? Um, and then finally, we've talked about autonomy um, because, you know, communities are seeking um, to, um, to, to show uh, a form of self-determination um, that, that enables them to define what the outcomes and circumstances for, the, for their, their lives are. Um, and so, you know, the, just kind of hearkening back to uh, that Lowndes County Freedom Organization and uh, that precursor to the Black Panther Party um, as a space that was attempting to develop an independent political movement, um, but it was attempting to pursue political power not for its own sake. It sought political power because it sought to define the parameters of uh, in which Black people could have thriving lives, right? Um, and so that that's ultimately, you know, um, part of what we what we're after when we're when we're talking about these notions of economy. And so uh, I'm really excited, you know, to um, continue dialoguing on this, and I'm excited for the conversation that we are. Uh, going to be having tonight. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, this brother, um, you know, who is a, a, a brother of spirit, you know, a brother of, of, of word, a brother in the arts. Um, and, you know, at, at, at sometimes when we're out out in space together, you know, they're like, hey, are you as physical brothers? Um, we, we, we could be, you know, I, I don't know, you know, what I mean, West Africa run deep, you know. <laughs> um, so to that extent, um, we've got Allende Jean Baptiste, um, poet, keeper of memory, um, we've noted someone who's commits acts of journalism, sometimes committing acts of journalism, you know, and, 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 and don't we all, right? Um, journey with the journalist. Um, connecting his histories within Chicago, the Caribbean, um, West Africa. Um, he, he's connected through, um, he's helmed the project Drum Language, um, experimental and experiential transmission, um, incorporating archival sound, field recording, original oral history, black dialogue, all of this drawing from the Afro diasporic expression. Um, and he's got this forthcoming project, Dusabo City, a live radio experience, again, drawing on um, drum language as any aesthetic um, and building a space for intergenerational exchange. Um, so this is uh, going to certainly be a, a most rich dialogue and I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, having that. Uh, so I'll go ahead and welcome in now, um, Allende Jean Baptiste. Uh, welcome, sir, you are on the line. Hopefully you didn't mute you. you got to unmute yourself. Or you, he might be. Are you still there? Fam, my fault, fam. Okay, all good, all good. <laughs> I was troubleshooting with you, like you know we. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it was me. It was on my end. I had we both had me muted, and I <laughs> I forgot. Okay, uh, all that it was a thing. Yes. So, you know. welcome, welcome. Um, you know, I, thank I, you. How is this uh, COVID nineteen moment treating you? You know what what is uh what has changed? What has evolved for you in this moment? We'll start with the easy questions. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, let's start with that question and say that uh, it has attuned me differently to what some of my personal resources are and how I'm managing them. So if we talk about um, economy, not necessarily precisely on the, um, but maybe some like there's something emotional capital, right? Yeah. If we if we say that, um, which I guess is somewhere at the juncture of spiritual and intellectual. <clears throat> but uh, the idea, connecting to the idea that presence, full presence, is a kind of uh, a labor itself, um, and that includes presence inside your household. It includes. Uh, presence, telepresence, and all these other things. So regulating um, that kind of energy and that kind of presence in ways that are healthy for you, you know, according to your capacity, but also according to 
the priorities of your commitments. The We may uh, abjure hierarchy in certain areas of our lives, but it is true that we have responsibilities at time, and sometimes those are emotional um, responsibilities that are that have hierarchy. I, I mean, I say that. So um, all that is a super roundabout way to say it, is like <laughs> um, trying to be compassionate with myself, and then in order to also be compassionate and tender with people who love me and who I love, uh, mm -hmm. while continuing to do whatever my work may be public facing, even if it's, even though the work is also work for the community, for, you know, the people as it were, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and, and, and another easy question, you know, just, we got to knock it out the way, um, you know, who, who'd you have in that Erica and Jill, you know, showdown? <laughs> um, listen, Jill Scott, <laughs> Here's what I feel. I think I feel like I feel like if you put all of Erica's lovers in a line and put them on one side of a battle and her on the other side, I would take Erica every day. You understand? Know <laughs> like bring uh who was it? DOC, J Elect, Com, Three Stacks, put them all in a line over here versus Erica. I I'll, I'll I'll put my money on Erica. Uh. But that the, but but I from the moment it was said because I remember from uh, Chappelle's block party that famous quote Jilly was like yo we're not in competition like our queendoms don't compare and so I never expected it to be a battle I always uh, expected it to be a celebration which it was and I, I appreciate it absolutely <laughs> all you come in with very very focused <laughs> you come in with some serious questions rather like I was like oh we informal we you know. Brother, cutting right to the root, you know, because brothers are radical. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that is where we are. And, you know, and now I'll give you some room to run then. Um, so before you take us through your your contemporary work, um, yeah. take us back through a journey, right? Um, travel back in time and tell us some of, some of the pathway that got you here, that got you to the work that you're currently doing. As, as you know, I mean, as, as full or as brief as you okay. feel like you, you want to cover that. Okay, well, I'm going to keep the clock. I see the clock in the top corner of my screen. So we're going <laughs> to deal with that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I could say in the beginning there was a beat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that modern physics calls it the Big Bang. Um you know, I could say a bunch of things, but but what I will say, um, first of all, is that, and this is going to relate. I, I I mean, all of these things relate because um, my work, a lot of my work, is in memory. Um, there were some people from a place high in the mountains um, in Jacmel in Haiti who they say like only could have lived they it was high in the mountains but they called the place la valet and uh my father says that that name was a send-off because you know you the oppressor never knew where they were going if you say it's the valley but you're really in the mountains right like people who only could have descended from the ruins and some of them found their way here um in the 50s there was a cat named Pierre Jean Paul who was had been a driver at a hotel in Port-au-Prince, and he made a relationship with uh, a patron who was there, um, who said, "Hey, come to the United States, and you know there may be some work for you." So he came. He traveled around, and when he visited Evanston and the Chicago area, he was like, "You know what? This is a place." that I could see building a family. You know, I could see bringing my family to build something because you know we have all these seasons, there are all these different kinds of people who live together. And I think through the strength of my back and shoulders and arms that I could make something and carve out something here. Um, and so he sent for his wife, um, who was my great aunt. 
and they started doing that thing. Um, around the corner from the house that I'm in, which is uh, my parents' home, a house that was purchased by about like six adults pooling their resources together. <laughs> you dig? Yes. Um, around the corner from this house that I'm in, which is about three miles from the shore of Lake Michigan, where um, in the 1800s, free black people lived before they were pushed away from the North Shore, where before, before that, um, this space was a gathering place for um, Menominee people and Ho-Chunk people and Potawatomi people, keepers of the fires. Mm-hmm. Um, like around the corner from my house now, there is a block that is named Pierre Jean-Paul Way, right? Because um, that's the kind of G he was. He lived on his own block. Um, that's part of the story of how I got here. Um, and why I'm from here. I was born in Brooklyn. I thought I was from there a lot of my life. When I moved there as an adult, I was like, oh, I'm from the shy. And that was cool because I never had a hierarchical experience of that. It was just like, I thought it was some different shit going on than it really was. Um, and I was raised here from a young youth in a vast community of, of, of custom and, and struggle and politics and, and blood. Um, I was raised by tall blacks. That's what I say. I was raised in a stand of giants and, um, it's some names, some of them whose names people know, a lot of them whose names people don't know, but they famous where I'm from and they, they made a difference in my formation. So, um, I'm winding this part up. I know it took like three or four minutes. Do your, um, do your thing. It's, it's, it's <laughs> in um, in there's another couple of names I'm gonna throw into here. So um, there was a woman who's actually my my first grandparent, and also turns out my last because she's the last one who bounced. Um, her name was Louise Cadet Trompet. Latour, um, she bounced in about in around January, um, and I apologize to the viewers. My eye contact thing is off because I just got my ergonomics proper. So I'm I'm trying to look at the green light. I'm gonna tilt it a little bit so it catches me and uh, my thinking rhythm. Anyway, so Louise uh, Cadet Trompet Latour. Um, she was important. She was my first and last grandparent. And uh, another person who just bounced in February, like right after her. So that was really a challenge. Um, his birthday is today. He would have made 90 years old. He's perhaps one of my, perhaps my greatest teacher as, as an adult. His name is Kamal Brathwaite. And he is the person who... Uh, charged me, let's say, rather than gave me permission to go in, uh, in, in my work and my writing and, and showed me in some ways the path where, where the communication through the art and the spirit and the culture freedom, the politic, like was all one thing. It was all part of a trajectory um, whose shape was spiral, and it all started with seed. It all started in the seed. So I know you, my brother, are like a mycelial type cat, you know, on some glissant type, rhizomatic type yes. style. I'm more of a like, you know, um, archipelago, cordillera, you know, mountain range type of cat. You know what I mean? But it's cool. We, we vibe. <laughs> Absolutely. But all of this stuff is about you know, what is submerged, the things that connect us across space and time, um, the things that move in our blood, and also the the ways that we can pull from from where we've been, uh, what are our roots and groundation in order to push, to move forward, like strategies, uh, tactics, and even 
a more expansive imagination than the than the one that we are subject to in this in this present moment like a, a, a panoply a plethora of, of expansive imaginations and and um, ways of knowing uh, and so in that like um, I appreciate being a part of this specific trajectory that I'm in here in the Ujamaa hour because um, I've known uh, Maida for more than 20 years. I, I've only known Damon for about what, about a year, but um, in the crossing of, of paths, there's different kinds of recognition and different kinds of feeling like, yo, we crossed in these moments for a reason like uh, like this investment will yield uh, something good for, for us as individuals and something good for people. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So you, you, you brought us uh, an expansive piece of memory uh, <laughs> from the past. You know, memory is good, right? I mean, that, there's, uh, there's capital that is, that is, that is the, the rooted cultural capital that we, we've referenced. Right. So take us into the the present. You know what what is um first of all maybe describe drum language and then then you know just kind of give us a, a feel um, a substance of what that 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 project was for you and sort of why then you know why that project um you know why did you get get to that space? Drum language was me being tired of saying what I was finna do. You know, yeah. um, so I had um. Let's see. I came to drum language not through a particular fascination with podcasting as a as a form, or even really understanding much of the potential of it, or or what the salience of it was even at that time, which was like around 2013. But more so, like it was about what I used to hear on the radio. It was really about black radio, black vocality, and black dialogue. That I w I was like, okay, what's the form now? Because um, actually, again, um, Baba Kamal had uh, some some theory that he made about the communities of listening, right? What is possible when people listen together, and when the communication that they're receiving is responsive. So, so this conversation, it's not just like uh, coming in, in one direction, but he talked about both ends of the radio beam. And he was specifically at that time talking about the use of radio in, in developing societies in, in the 1960s um, in the Caribbean, in the newly kind of independent uh, Caribbean. And I had by 2013 for about six years. I had been, I had been experimenting and doing some different things with sound, uh, and looking for pe people, friends, to be like, "Yo, I want to start. I want to do a podcast. Like, do it with me. Do it with me." And nobody was really trying to do it with me. <laughs> and even after like lots of conversations, you know those where we like have the meeting and the planning and the whatever. And so finally, I was just like, "Hey, man, look, I." It was a period of time that was interesting. I was in transition. I was living in Brooklyn at the time. I had felt Chicago calling me in some some strong ways. I had applied for BZ had a Chicago Public Media had this fellowship, the Pritzker Journalism Fellowship at the time. That was a really interesting and open kind of ended uh, entree into public media making that I had applied to, but it, it got there was like a cool, there was some structural stuff that happened that summer. So it got canceled. But as part of the application project, I had processed, I had made my first like radio style piece. And, you know, just like I made it on the phone, you know, use whatever little apps, plugins. So I got myself a little bit of training and I was just like, yo. And the first couple of raggedy and I was like, I had moved past the point of being so caught in the aesthetics, right? The perfect being the enemy of, of good, that, that piece. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I'm growing and learning in public. I don't mind. Yeah. Like, here we go. So it was a, something that lasted for about two years. It was roughly a two-year project. And I was trying to channel 
the things I heard on the kind of folks I heard on the radio, like Art Cribs and Herb Kent and Cliff Kelly, those kinds of folks, even like Don Cornelius or Nikki Giovanni when she had her public access show, or like Bob Law or um, Frankie Crocker. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm pulling these d- different influences, like Felipe Luciano, he had the show on BAI. Um, uh, a cat who I, I knew, a, a Haitian elder of mine, who uh, had a show on uh, independent show, this cat, Daoud Andre, at the time in Brooklyn. You know, just the things that I was hearing. And then the kind of music that I heard growing up in the house was. It was the news, you know what I mean? We was listening to uh, uh, Hugh Masekela, Mary McCaba, you know, you got Nina Simone on the box, Fela was in the crib from a shorty, you got Sparrow from Trinidad, Calypsonians, cats, Haitian cats like Mano Chalmain. Um, so it was real rich and people was talking about some stuff, you know, we used to do Curtis Mayfield or even, you know, folks was talking about something, Tracy Chapman, look, don't get me started. So, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I just did the uh, 10 albums in a 10 days IG thing. Right. And I um, I put Tracy Chapman in one of my joints because I was like, don't sleep on Tracy Chapman before I have to learn, y'all. So, you know, these things where um, we could move to, we could, we could communicate, and we're also... Uh, and, and, like, you should also be able to bounce a little bit. You know what I mean? Like... Um, that's what drum language was about. And um, the, over the course of doing that, I didn't necessarily build a huge audience, right? Uh, building audience is for myself is not my greatest skill. Uh, it's something that I've been able to do working with, for other people, working with other people. But uh, myself, I always feel like things are going to find their level, which is not so accurate for today's media ecosystem. <laughs> uh, you know, like the signal to, I, I probably have some more stuff to figure out about that. Mm-hmm. But what I did develop through the work was, one, I knew that it was feeding people because the small audience that I had was reflecting back to me the ways that it got them through. And I as a part of my path and experience, I mean, it's, it's my, my blessing that uh, in Creole, there's a term, there's a word called encadrement, which if you, you can hear it, it's re- related to the word cadre, right? I mean, the way we use it, that I have been blessed to be a, a part of what I think I really wanted uh, for since I remember a teenager. So which is a powerful pattern. So let's say right now, a lot of people are talking about <clears throat> Parable of the Sower, which is a ill book that I love. Yes. Um, I read that book in the summer of 1999 when I was um, coming out of high school. And, but the first summer was Wild Seed. And so the idea of collective, right? Um, as a pattern where people's spirits and hearts are and intentions and then energy is, is connected. People can cover each other's weaknesses with their strength and then in turn be covered um, is something that I desired and I realized to, a, to an extent I have. So anyway, built out of drum language was an aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the frames of that are... Um, you know, the drum, rememory, and media solidarity, which is different than something like access or information as aid. It's really about um, representing people in ways that they can recognize a certain amount of uh, integrity and and uh, a solidarity, something that can help feed people and move people as they do the things that they must do that they have recognized themselves and identified themselves that they must do so um yeah this piece Dusabo city is interesting in this moment because it's 
you know, it's predicated on gathering. So I'm I'm in the moment trying to reimagine what it looks like, but I will talk a little bit about why it's meaningful to me right now. Mm-hmm. Uh and how we doing? We got like a high fifteen. <laughs> Time is 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 movable, right? It's a movable object. So you listen. Know. Erica said she don't even know what that is, <laughs> but she also but then she also said, "Wait, we got to wrap this up because I got an after party." So I was like, you know, we can be, you know, multiple. We contain multitudes, right? We do. Um, let me say, who who? Okay, before I talk about Dusabo City which is, um, you know, next time I would have put some, lo- I would have had some logos and stuff too, man. I didn't want to mess with the, but it's cool. It's cool. It's all right. <laughs> we it's got split. It. You know what I'm saying? I see it. I have it on, I have it on multiple. Um... Yes. <laughs> so, so um, let's say, hmm, about gathering. Um, and some of the value that it has uh, for us in our communities. Um, And one of the, it's one of the things that makes this moment really challenging in in some ways, um, both about, you know, intergenerational uh, things that we are are essential for, for a lot of us. Um, And I mean, um, black and indigenous and people of color specifically, right? In in the ways that we connect with ancestors, which is and it's demonstrated by the casual, like, oh, they want to economy, right? That whole thing. Well, we're not gonna go too far over there. I'm just saying, like, so um, about gathering the space of. Um, you and I, as you introduced me, uh, this is like the first, actually it's funny because it's live and this is the, the, we've, we've caught up a couple times yes. in some, in a couple spaces, but it's more, it's more like interstitial. Yes. Right. Um, and when I moved back home after being, um, after after by home I mean here uh, after living home in Brooklyn for a while I started hearing your, I had started hearing your name before but people would like assumed right people were like yo you know and I was like no but then I was like oh okay so the spaces that we the first few spaces I actually remember us meetings were in the space of the round like in the space of the dance right and. So this is a powerful space because it represents some things. It, it it's it's the cipher and the harda and the the drum circle and and all these things at once, right? It's the ring shout and the um in in these ways that people are not competing with each other. But I heard somebody say today, um, this is the Arachelis Grime. She was talking about that space where your hearts are facing center, mm-hmm. right? Uh, everybody's hearts is facing center. That was, interest, was interesting to me, and that was, again, reflecting back on, on the things that I learned and traveled with, with Rabbi Kamal, in that it also makes me think about... Um, I mean, that's a collective space, right? Yes. That's a space where people are sharing their energy and kind of even fueling each other and each other and, and not just gathering, but like gathering each other, right? Yes. Um, and, it also, and it also is no question it's related to our traditions of, of relationship and belonging to and with the land, mm-hmm. right? I'm... I'm getting, I'm going where you asked me to go. I'm go- <laughs> but so, and and so then I will say this again, like the idea that um, the space of land 
that we were able to sometimes access and reclaim proximal to um, inside some of the plantation systems in this hemisphere, um, like a little plot of land, like it was, you know, the reason that that was always contested, on the one hand, it let the the masters be less responsible for nutrition and nourishment, right? It's like, y'all have your own time, go over there and like grow your own food. And over here, we just doing like extractive agriculture, right? We're not, you know, we're not growing nothing that could feed nobody. It's, this is all drugs. You know what I'm talking about, right? Ca- you know, caffeine, sugar, cocoa, you know, chocolate. It's drugs, right? That's the whole... I have a, I have things. I'll send you some things. Anyway. <laughs> right? Like, this is like... I don't know. I haven't seen anything else written about this, about, like, the way that it was, like, the whole... That whole colonial ag- uh, ag- plantation system was, like, a, like a narco-trafficking structure. But anyway. Um, but, yo, so... But in that space of the plot, and we were able to plot. That's what my that's what that's what Kamal said. He said like, but in the space of the plot, we were able to plot because he was talking about the things that people carry, the seeds that people carry, like in their cheek or under their tongue, you know, below decks or like in the fold of something, the little loincloth garment, whatever, right? And the the seeds that they were able to bring and plant, and some of those seeds. Are specific specifically spiritual seeds and some of those species are generative we've seen some of those species um of of some of that fauna that was brought by people before anyway boom 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 we move in disciple city is about a whole lot of things good 821 all right <laughs> disciple city is like Act just like this. Look, man, we talking about 200 years ago. There was a cat who died basically penniless in St. Charles, Missouri, right? But be- before that, if we just want to rewind how it went, before that moment of being alienated and displaced, um, dispossessed of the of the properties and, and that he had built, um for for the purpose of tonight the um the product of his labor right alienated from the products of his labor and then also um so this is a cat who he's born his very existence is uh a product of this 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 colonial encounter right this 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 ongoing catastrophe that we've been in um you know, for five, six hundred years, right? So that thing is happening. He gets to New Orleans. He's lost his papers on the journey. So that means he's undocumented. He's somebody who needs sanctuary and he takes refuge. Um, he's, you know, there's some folks who were, I think some Jesuits look out and then he, he meets and links with uh, some native people down there and they look out. So he's He's up there with his homeboy from when he was a shorty. So he's never alone. He's never moving through any of this as an individual. Mm -hmm. He comes up with his homeboy, another cat that they meet in Louisiana, whose name is only recorded as uh, uh, the name of the tribe that he was from. They come up through here. They get mentored by Pontiac, who is a major figure. Listen, Pontiac is a major figure, B. Mm -hmm. So, um, and who is building peace between multiple tribes who have competing interests in the area, right? So he's mentored, welcomed, trained as a steward of the land and also as a violence interrupter, as a peace builder, as a coalition builder, right? Mm -hmm. He partners with a sister, um, a Potawatomi sister named Kirihawa, who um, has functionally kind of been erased. But we want to know what she knew about because we know that without what she knew about, he wasn't doing nothing out here, you know what I mean? Because, (laughs) and they build a family together. I'm in the middle of this, the war 1812 pops off and he's incarcerated by the British as like a political prisoner. And he spends about three or four years um, and they they end up turning him into a steward of their land holdings, right? 
So he's over there. So like, I'm like, all of this stuff. Then he comes back out. They do, you know, Chicago is what it is. Somehow, hook, and I don't really trust the record. Like, yo, Julia Kinsey, don't get me started. Like, she the one that wrote the story. And look, she's suspect. So, um, listen, you already know. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, somehow, either by lease or sale, something happens. And he's like, gentrified out of his crib you know what i'm saying go to st charles you know woke up woke up dead one day and broke but listen how many red or black or brown people do you know from out here who one of those parts or more than one of those parts of his identity and story is their story like 200 years later absolutely like that's so the project is about that the project is about asking um, the questions of like why that is. I got some suspicions, but I want to invite people to collectively <laughs> generate um, generate thoughts, theory, and I also want to connect to uh, not only storytellers who may be scholars. You know, they may have some degrees in their name, but they may be other kinds of keepers of memory um, from the block or different types of traditional um, uh, passages, you know, bearers of culture and memory, um, and people who are working on some of these issues today, whether we're dealing with, um, uh, when we talk about murdered and mi missing indigenous women at the same time as we're talking about um, black women who get disappeared, you know, like Am no Amber Alerts and also like the histories of like potential, maybe it was a serial killer, but we just never paid attention because it was only black women, right? Like these things are not totally distinct from each other in my understanding. Or are we talking about, um, you know, what black wealth building or not? Uh, we talking about building in collectives. We talk about what happens when we erase parts of memories and stories. And um, so we're going to see what form that takes this year. Um, I don't think, yeah, you know, I'm not spending a bunch of time like worrying about the year that wasn't or the, the alternate history of the present, which is yes. something that I was talking about with somebody last week, like what, what might've been today. Um, I'm interested in what's translatable and where we can build some of these conversations. And, you know, and sometimes these conversations require a, a bit of nudging and other times, you know, you just uh, uh, let a guest on the Ujima hour and they go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and, and you know, I actually like uh, there was a beautiful circle that you drew around that. Right. Um, because I started this conversation earlier talking about society building and talking about consensus. And, you know, you you veered into that that area of the Potawatomi. Right. Um, and even sort of thinking about indigenous uh, forms of governance, you know, uh, consensus building and circle keeping is there, right? You know, that's that's the present, um, the, the the space of governing gatherings, right? Um, so when you're thinking about gatherings, you know, how are you thinking about the ownership and the keeping of space? You know, does that how does that sort of factor in your mind when you think about gathering? I saw this really dope, and I I forget. Actually, I'm gonna pull it up before we're done, mm -hmm. so that I can cite properly. But I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it right now. Um, this really ill. I, I was in some webinar about like artists responding to the, uh, you know, it was like the first week of the shelter in place, right? And somebody was talking about even this digital space, mm -hmm. right? Is constructed. Is constructed from intellectual labor, but it's also constructed from the labor of people's bodies. Uh, what are the precious metals? What are the lands that these fiber optic cables move across, right? Like how are, how are the rights to exploiting these things? So even all the digital stuff, right? Like there are elements of consideration uh, that we are not always 
we haven't necessarily been sensitive all the time to, uh, you know, take in. But but I'm interested in all of that. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's like the Coltan in the phones or like the platinum and gold in the wires, you know what I mean? Um, or uh, the the way that the space or the air, right? We're talking about... So one of the reasons that radio is so still magnetic to me, um, no pun intended, <laughs> um, is... Uh, I don't even know that, it, that there are many people who would think that was a pun, so I, that's me just being super. But anyway, <laughs> but, but it's because the air, it's like licensed, right? But it's like we all... But the air... You know, either it's a public asset or it's it's not an asset at all because we belong, we are beings of, you know, earth, wind, and fire, right? Yeah. Like, we are, because we belong to, the like, the air, who does the air belong to? Who does the land belong to? Who does the water belong to, right? So, that's one thing, but also, um, the radio, listen, we talking about, so, uh, you know, drum language, there's a, not a conceit at all in there, but really, like, I was really thinking about the way that sound uh, reverberates, right, and the language of the drum, like drum telegraphy, like that, that as a practice and a, and a whole discipline. And, you know, at this point now, like, s some of these things may break down, man. We, we got to be, we got to come, come with drum language and smoke signals. We got to come... You dig? Like, we got to be prepared to bring all of the uh, wisdom that we can gather from our ancestors and, and forebears. And I don't only mean blood ancestors, but I mean inclusive of those folks who have graciously welcomed us into the spaces, right? Like, like or ingraciously sometimes. Like, we, you know, we were all being, you know, we were bodies in the system, right? Yes. Uh, so um, in the space of gathering, though, I think, you know, the things that I bring right now to my work right now, especially are like humility and an open ear, because some of the spaces that I'm entering, I'm really learning uh, what some of the dynamics are. I feel like this when I when you reached out to me, I was like, oh, OK. You know what I mean, and I was like, I'm like, sure, let's 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 get into some stuff. Uh, because I have been reflecting a lot, but I also, to some extent, like, I've been on my Dave Chappelle. I've been, like, semi out the game for about 15. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'd be under here, you know, I'd be in the background. Like, I, um, so, so when I'm gathering with people, uh, I'm, I find myself listening a lot, uh, and trying to be humble and, and try to, um, figure out what people, what space there is that people can make, right? We all have, we have a lot of stuff that's pulling on us right now. And um, I think there are ways that some of the things that are moving through me that I, that I feel like I have to bring into the world, they feel really urgent to me, but I'm aware that they may not feel urgent to everybody. They may not be, you know, um, so that means that I, may have to do a different job or a better job maybe of articulating or just connecting it to what people are actually concerned about. And I think that's always um, the task of anybody who partially lives in, inside their head, right? And I, I don't, I say that that way because I'm not trying to um, put, put no hierarchy on what is an intellectual or isn't. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a cat who happens to like, I live in my head a lot. So that means I have to connect to what people are feeling like the viscera of, 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 of the moment in order to, so people would be like, like, Oh, that's maybe a little bit useful. Ah, uh, that's not so much, but it sound it's, I like the way you said it though. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh. I can I can identify certainly with living in one's head um, and, you know, just in terms of and situating that in the conversation around sharing space. Uh, one of the things I shared in Co-op for Live one day was really about um, 
you know, Co-op Polib is an exercise in community building and relationship building and community organizing. Um, but to that, that, that listening and that relationship building aspect, uh, one of the things I shared one day was really about the fact that I do, you know, read multiple texts. I mean, like my Goodreads probably has about 100 texts that are in my currently reading list. Um, and I'm just kind of cycling in and out, you know, of, of several ideas at once. And so sometimes when I'm speaking in space, uh, in, in particular in Co-op for Live, I'm talking about um, things in a manner that, that connotes a sense of urgency. And I had to one day really just kind of share, um, you know, just be vulnerable and transparent and say, look, you know, I speak urgently and I, I have, you know, a sort of rapid tone sometimes about how I'm getting, trying to get ideas out of my head before they disappear. Right. Um, but I'm not trying to foist my urgency upon you. Um, it's just that I have to get these ideas out and I have to pursue these ideas. Um, right. and, 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 you know, but I just want you to know that I'm willing to take this, you know, to, um, you know, um, Grace Lee Boggs point at the speed of relationship or, you know, whoever. Right. So, you know, just. Yo, facts. <laughs> take Yo. It yourself. I mean, I mean, what didn't she say those facts, though? So anyway, that's like redundant. You say her name is facts. But also, <laughs> yes, the, and that the movement uh, uh, to borrow again is like you it's an evolutionary movement in, inside your own uh, spirit and your own orientation toward building relationship with people and also um, building your practice so that your practice can catch up with, you know, so that it is a practice, right? So that it catches up with like the way that you like to think about yourself or, you know, the things that you may be able to start to recognize are important, but you haven't figured out how to put them in into work for you, you know, and um, yeah, two things real quick. One, the the cat was Adrian Wong from the spy, something called Spiderweb Show in Ontario. That that's who um, who who wrote the digital acknowledgement that I encountered and that made me I really appreciated um, piece piece that. And then also, yeah, I mean, because right here, you know. <laughs> the thing I think it's there's a value and in like bringing text but also uh we we tell stories we human beings we story telling machines and and also though that means we like story making machines so like the the history of somebody's life their practice is a text right and the things that we learn uh from our cohorts uh, from our elders and from from our you know folks who are younger than us who are coming up after us the things that they can see and do differently that just didn't occur you know out, just outside of our imagination like this is all reading this is all uh textual textual analysis you know um and it's all worth doing and it it takes different kinds of intelligences you know um that like everybody has access to some of what we need, right? Yeah. In order for us to go far together. Um, like today, when I, like, <laughs> like the three, no, just the three things real quick that I was thinking about coming into here before this was like, I was thinking about um, the concept of the combeat. <laughs> and I was going to talk about like the way it was explained in like Masters of the Do. I was talking about, I was thinking about the concept of Susu, you know, which is coming from the Caribbean, also another thing, but Jadena got a song, Susu, like that's a text, right? That's equally valuable talking about attuning our minds to these things. And I was thinking about Kilon Bismo, which uh, was philosophized, innovated by Abdias do Nascimento in 1980, like, which is like a, you know, a real super dense kind of like, but you know, whatever. We all out here. Uh, no, that that we 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 all out here. Um, yeah, I, I've got you know multiple things that are just circulating through my mind, and I'm trying to unpack and settle on one. You know, one of the things that's like floating around <laughs> is like you know um, to your point about the the sort of story. Um, um, I'm connecting that to a conversation that I was listening to. Um, I think it's the last last panel that I saw Frankie Knuckles on, um, I think, and Baraka De Soleil was uh, there, and um, Baraka was 
giving a, a message, something about um, the, the sort of the the art of anti archiving, um, which was, hmm. you know, because I mean, we, they were they were there was a conversation that was going on about about the sort of archiving of house culture, right? Um, and there was yes. a, another a side conversation going on around um, this notion that you know, yeah, you you can focus on the archiving aspect, and there's a certain you know um, held vision in time. But then there's also this other aspect that the archive is living and the archive is, you know, to your point, is memory and it's oral and it's and, you know, and there's there's a lot that you miss in terms of, you know, the transmission um, when you're trying to stick it in an archive. And that sort of other part of gathered dynamic, that other part of relationship, that other economy, you know, um, right, that, right, 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 is not is disconnected. Right. You know, the archive is most archives are not living things, you know, or, or well, actually, no, maybe, maybe that's a lot. I, I, I'll go back. Well, <laughs> well, the ones that people have made, right? Yes. Are a certain kind of thing. And then there's also like layers of sediment in the, in a canyon and rings on a tree and all kinds of things that are also archival, right? That we, we know, uh, I mean, I don't know how to unlock all of those things, but I know that they tell stories. Um, yes, and yeah, I think the the desire or impulse to turn something into static, you know, there's an artist, a a, um, a two-spirit Black Indigenous artist out of Ohio named M. M. Carmen Lane, and I saw them up here in Northwestern uh, in February, it must have been. And they were talking about the between a shrine and an altar. And they were saying that a shrine is a dead place, right? And an altar is a living place. And so thinking of this, especially the kinds of obstacles that thrown, get thrown up and like, is an archive accessible? Is it, and is it something that evol can evolve or is it, some you know you put it on a shelf to you know to take all the it's like a Dr King Happy Meal or some shit you know what I mean sorry that's my second <laughs> curse word <laughs> oh, good. you know what I mean it's like oh we this the dream was to hold hands and sing songs and it's like uh, uh, not so much homie you know yes like the dream of house music was not only like. I don't know these uh, dead mouse or something like that was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, well that 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 would get to the caricature of the caricature, which is you know something I've talked about with hip hop a lot. You know, like I mean, yeah, there was a there was a hip hop, and then there was a well, actually not. There there was a caricature of hip hop, and then there's uh, people who then imitate the imitation. You know, but. Um, I, I, I don't get, you know, well, right. Like your whole, your whole traject career trajectory, you're like your business plan is actually CB4 though. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> Connection. Connection. Like we would joke it. We would joke. Like they yeah. were joking. They were, they were making, anyway, it's fine. It's, it's, that's what you want to do, I guess, you know? Yes. So um, we'll circle back around to um, this notion of, uh, of autonomy and, um, Connect the practice that you're working on to um, this notion of marinage. You know, I've talked previously in, in our first autonomy episode about this idea of marinage and about liberated zones and about the, the desire to seek these liberated zones as sort of one form of kind of self-determined economies. So, yes. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, so so there are a couple of things, right? Then this is a really useful question. Um, and again, this is a question that gets to, you know, praxis. This is a question about praxis because um, I I was initially trying to. This is a a trajectory. It was came from a dream and a charge and some other things over seven or eight years. Uh, I was initially going to tr try to bring it forth last year. One of the things that was really important to me, I was like, I'm not crowdfunding this because I do not want the community to have to pay for this thing that's supposed to be for them. Like they, I, if once I get it running, I would like, 
I will in, invite them to contribute in certain ways if they want to, if they feel like it has brought them value, like as a gestural thing, not so much as like, oh, y'all, you know, I was, I'm trying to figure out how it can be something that is not, not commodified, but then also is not dependent on the kinds of structures that you, you have, you are dependent on when it's something that's like grant funded or other stuff. So initially I was like, okay, I was just putting money to the side a little, little by little. And like, okay, it was like trying to do like a lean startup kind of vibe. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I had some snags last spring where I, the whole rest of my life, there was multiple things I was burning out from. I had been moving through the year in a way that was, um, it was like, I was, it was like about fierce urgency, but I realized that I was veering toward the types of moves that you make when you're actually dealing with from fear. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was after a series in the fall of uh, 2018. I had three deaths in my family in very quick succession. And then there was a brother named Brian Sleet, who I don't know if you have heard his name. Um, he was a cat who I went to high school with. Um, and he had just made like 42. He passed on my birthday. This was right at the end of the year. So I came in like, yo, you with the you could die any day type attitude. I entered 2019 like that. And I was just like, yo, I'm doing everything. And eventually my reach kind of exceeded my grasp. Right. So <laughs> then I I packed those things together, the different kinds of lessons in the last few years. And I was like, OK, I'm going to come into 2020 in a different we're going to move differently. Um, we're gonna like let things emerge as they as they should and figure out what imagine together what some of the spaces are. So actually, um, you mentioned um, uh, uh, Baraka and I think so. We'll see. I may have an opportunity to to forward Yusabo City with three Um We'll see when the when the uh, when the announcement comes out, mm -hmm. but even if 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 not that, um, I'm just interested in collaborating with people in spaces whose whose uh, fidelity is clear. You know, what like allegiance is clear, um, and if that's what I feel like is there's a value that I just have to do something to like get it, bring it forward, and. Even though, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned when I when I started about drum language, you know, um, things have not, in my experience lately, always like found their level. I I do have faith that it will feed who it's meant to, and that you know, like the path will emerge to a certain extent. Some of it is actually an exercise in obedience, and 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 faith for me, um, which, like real talk, you know what I mean. Yes. Uh, and, and I do apologize for viewers and anyone who, uh, you know, did not wrap their head around that term marinage, marinage, simply, you know, um, a, a term meaning escape, <laughs> right, you know, into sort of into liberated spaces, maroon societies in Jamaica's uh, quilombos in Brazil, uh, the, the great dismal swamp in the Carolinas. All of those right. places that Palenques, you know what I'm saying? All that. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying so, I want to make sure that folks are grappling with that. So, um, Tell us how folks can connect with the project, can connect with you, you know, if they want to kind of plug in or, you know, just, I mean, just follow. Um, is it, would, it, what does that look like? You know, are you just oh, <laughs> still trying to make sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I have, you know, every once in a while, it's like, you know, I'll have a, something will just come through me that will come, that will be born of the, the drum language aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And those, those sounds <laughs> uh, are on SoundCloud at Iensco. Uh, and actually, you can find me anywhere at Iensco, really. Like, if you're looking at Iensco someplace, that's me. You know what I mean? Um, so IG has... Uh, IG is a space that I will use to guide people through DuSable City as it emerges as something. But there were several... Yeah, again... You know, when you're dealing with collaboration and, and, and potential partnerships, right, like everybody's 
adjusting and shaking out right now. So um, I'm looking forward to reconnecting with some folks soon who both students and teachers who have like are coming out of this like May period where they're like, OK, now online classes are over. What was you talking about again? <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I'm also um, I've I've been really fortunate. Uh, I took a position um, doing storytelling with free write arts and literacy and which is for anybody who doesn't know is an organization that uses art um, to support uh, criminalized young people in being the subjects of their own histories, the senses of their own narratives. And that looks like a lot of things that looks like work inside like facilities that looks like work outside facilities that, that looks like mitigation and arts practice development and also support in moments sometimes when folks have been are returning home and trying to figure out what the path is. Um, so that coincides, you know, joining this joining staff there after I've been in, being an artist educator with them over the last year at the same time as this thing was happening and we're I'm learning I'm, I'm getting into the flow and we're also pivoting around response and, and how to proceed like that's feeling a little bit more steady now so it's like you know you got to focus on some things I just buried my grandmother you know what I mean like it's a lot of real life every day out here that um yeah so we'll see Holla at me at Iensco anywhere, and um, if you want to talk, we'll talk. You know what I'm saying? No doubt, no doubt. And I, <laughs> so folks have in the comment section, you've got the the SoundCloud link, you've got the Instagram link, so you know connect uh, with uh, Yende at uh, those two places. Catch those drum language archives. Um, yeah, and you know, and keep keep following the work, keep following the project. Um, and and you know, we 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 really dig and appreciate um having uh having him on as our guest um so before we uh we, we head up out of here you know i'm just going to uh make a uh, very brief plug uh for co-op for lib um so so for folks you know who are not familiar with the co-op uh, cooperation for liberation study and working group uh again you know i mentioned at the top of the broadcast um that we meet every other sunday our next uh, meeting is going to be uh, may 17th um, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. And, you know, really, you know, again, we're just kind of digging through and unpacking um, the cooperative tradition, uh, both in the sort of uh, in Black right, in, in history, right, and then also contemporary examples of ways that we are uh, uh, imagining and building um, and developing uh, self-determined economies, you know, so there are certainly, you know, ways that, that we are using this model to advance that. Um, but also drawing back on our historical uh, practice and our, 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 our cultural memory um, to draw forward cooperation into the present, right? You know, so it's not just about the fact that, you know, that there was a Rochdale cooperative in uh, England in the 1800s, but it's really about the notion that, you know, um, uh, as, as I talked to Kamal, uh, Dr. Kamal Rashid about, you know, in the broadcast pr previously, um, when we escaped, when we moved into communities, you know, uh, advancing our liberation uh, from from spaces of bondage in North, in North America and else and elsewhere, um, we did not create the same structures that we are living under now. We created new structures. We created new forms of governance. We created uh, forms of economy that actually addressed need. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, cooperation for liberation is about digging back into that history and that cultural memory. Uh, so. That is in the comment section for folks to plug into. Um, also, uh, I will make sure that you all know about our upcoming time salon uh, on May 22nd. So the Cold Nut Collaborative has a, a monthly uh, fourth Friday time salon um, that you know uh, you can plug into if you're if you're unfamiliar with the Cold Nut Collaborative time bank, or if you want to get more familiar. Um, then you know uh, May 22nd, uh, 6 p.m. is when we have our, our monthly time salon. And that's, you know, both of those are happening over Zoom so that, you know, you all can uh, figure out, you know, it, it, ways to kind of engage with that. Um, and when we are back in the public space, we generally meet at Floods Hall in Hyde Park, um, if that's convenient and local to you. Uh, and finally, um, actually, wait, did I? Yeah, no. <laughs> Boom. 
Uh, and finally, um, the archives. So if you uh, want to dig into the Ujima Hour archives, they are all available on Facebook Watch. Um, they are also available on YouTube. Uh, but, you know, uh, the link that I have available to, to shoot to you right now is the, is the Facebook Watch. So you can dig into the archives and you can see um, who we've talked to so far. You can see uh, my, my brief technically glitching uh, uh, interview with Maida McNeil uh, last uh, month. You can see the interview with Damon Williams. You can see the interview with Chinyure Ote of the Cowrie Collective out of St. Louis. Dear Heart, um, you can see the interview with Joan Fadiro, and then you can go way back in 2019 and you know see all of the amazing folks that we plugged in plugged in with that that year. Um, you know, from Jamila Medley, Dara Cooper, National Black Food and Justice Alliance, um, and all, all of our all of us our archives are there. So you know, dig into those. Uh, and up next month, um, we're going to be having. Um, Lasaya Wade of Brave Space Alliance here. So, uh, you know, tune in June 8th uh, for that. Um, and then going forward, uh, Elizabeth Carter of Urban Cooperative Legal, uh, uh, formerly of Urban Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center. Uh, in August, uh, Gregory Jackson of Sustainable Economies Law Center and Repaired Nations. Uh, September, Bianca Shaw of Tribe. Uh, October, Eric Jackson of Black Yield Institute. Uh, November, Malikia Johnson of, of Take Care of Each Other World Tour. And then capping off in December, Alita Torre, uh, Parable of the Sower, Intentional um, Community Cooperative. So um, dig in, keep tuned for all of those things. Um, you know, we'll we'll make sure that you know you you have uh, more um, more economy, more cooperation, more culture. All of those things are happening. So, um, are there any final words that you wanna wanna leave folks with uh, today? Man, listen. I appreciate the time and space to um, think together in in public. I, <laughs> uh, and yeah, man, be gentle with yourselves and each other. I feel like that's something that we our vision in this hemisphere and worldwide is urgent and has been urgent. We are already amidst an ongoing traumatic event, an ongoing catastrophe, but there are inside of it that we are finding and uncovering every day left to us by our ancestors um, and brought to us through our descendants uh, mm -hmm. that hold the way for us if we hold on to each other. Mm -hmm. That's my word. Hmm. That's the word. Um, it is uh, now... 27 minutes past the hour. We generally, you know, go around uh, 60 minutes to 75, you know, uh, but, you know, I'm glad to keep the, to, to violate the boundary of time with you, brethren. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> listen, space time. Listen, we do things. We can do things. <laughs> so folks, this has been uh, this month's broadcast of the Ujima Hour. Um, again, you know, tune in in June. Uh, we'll have another one for you. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you all in the conversation and in the chat. Um, until then, uh, peace, love, cooperation, all of those things. Um, and we will see you on the other side of the economy. Good night. <laughs>